All right. Uh, so everyone, good morning. And uh, to those in, the diff in every other part of the world, good evening or good afternoon. It's, it's great to have you all here. And again, it's great to have Pat back for another session of uh, in the Formula Bharat Ac Academy series. Uh, every year, Pat has always been there to the event and has uh, graced his presence at, the, at Pat's Corner, answering your questions whether um, for new teams and older teams alike. So Pat, it is so good to have you over here. Uh, for those who don't know uh, a little bit about Pat's journey, so Pat actually uh, found out about Formula SAE in 1994 when he was visiting US on business. And um, in 1996, he decided to volunteer and he, he was recruited as a design judge by Carol Smith at his first event as a judge in 99 in the UK. Then they started Formula SAE Australia, Australasia in 2000. And then he was invited to help start FSG in 2006. And then uh, obviously we're here with Formula Bharat and he spends a lot of time in with FS Russia and Formula Bharat as well. Uh, and also many competitions in the world. So this is just not uh, the only ones that he's involved in. Uh, Pat's retired quite a long time back right now, but... Um, <laughs> He spends most of his time uh, dedicated towards uh, ensuring that students are equipped with uh, the right basics when they get into formula students. Uh, he's very um, determined uh, to, to ensure that people understand the basics of motorsport education uh, and even engineering education and the reasoning, the whys of why you choose to do something uh, in design. Uh, so without further ado, um, uh, we would like to introduce Pat to his session on keeping your tires happy. So Pat, hi and welcome again. Thank you, Kathy. Um, as Kathy pointed out, I've been involved as a judge, as a, a mentor, as an organizer, a, a foundation person, whatever, for Formula student events all over the world, uh, effectively. In recent years, I've decided to back away from the major events. Um, so I no longer really involve myself with uh, Formula SAE in the US or a Formula Student in the UK or a Formula Student Germany, um, because realistically, they don't need me anymore. Those events are now uh, mature enough that they can stand on their own two feet. And these days I am focusing more on helping the emerging teams and emerging events uh, in countries where, where my help is, is really needed. My interest in the event is not so much motorsport, it's more, um, more whoops, let's go back again. It's more uh, to do with um, the educational aspects. Uh, so today, what I'm going to talk about is tires in a basic way. I found one thing that's happened uh, over the years of formula is that these presentations from various presenters have just got more and more uh, complex and more and more advanced. It means that uh, students at the entry level are being left behind because they just can't talk the talk or, or walk the walk or talk the talk, as they say. So normally, a presentation about tires starts off with a slide like this. Now that's Dr. Hans Pajeka or the late Dr. Hans Pajeka, a Dutch uh, scientist who apparently worked out all the tricks and tire, uh, tricks and foibles of rubber tires and he's put them all into a magic formula. I don't believe in magic formulas. And it starts off with this complex Y equals D times sine and so on and so forth and it gets more complex. We ain't going there, not today. We're not going to talk about that sort of stuff. I'll leave that to other presenters. Today, we're gonna to talk about the more basic stuff. And also today, we'll talk about some of the enforced uh, choices that teams in places like India have to, have to make. And that is the unavailability of the perfect tire. By the way, there is no perfect tire. Okay, so the first decision you're gonna make is how do you choose the tire? What's, your, what's, what's the best choice of tire? You know, you're, you're, you're fully aware that the only grip that you have between your car and 
terra firma, the ground, the track, is the four little contact patches under your tires. It doesn't take uh, Einstein to figure out that obviously the best and stickiest tire is probably going to re result in a, a better performance. Clue number one, that's not necessarily the case, but we'll talk about that later. In order to discover what this tire would be or could be, about a decade or 12 year, years or so ago, a group of um, universities uh, formed what's called the TTC, the Tire Testing Consortium. And they actually have all the Formula student tires tested uh, at CalSpan, which is a, a, a tire testing facility in New York State in the US. And they come up with the best tires or the best recommendations. And they tend to align their findings with the teachings and the language of the late Dr. Pajega. Um, I'm going to be contentious here and say that for an inexperienced team who don't understand what that's all about, like don't waste your time chasing down whatever is supposedly the best tire from the, from the TTC data. The TTC data is excellent value for money. The team pay $500 US and for that they get in perpetuity forever, all of the tire data of all of the tires suitable for formula student that have been tested at CalSpan. Uh, this includes some very useful data that, you know, uh, more advanced or more experienced young engineers can use in ways other than de designing little race cars. I mean, you know, little race cars are a very small part of what happens in the world today. But I'm going to suggest that you don't necessarily need to be part of the tire testing consortium at this stage. Uh, to let a cat out of the bag, the best formula student tire that we've seen perform on the track at the serious competitions where, where the level of competition is very high is not one of the top two or three tires that test best on the rolling road machine at CalSpan. And there are of course reasons for that. The tires tested on a tire testing machine are not fitted to a car. They're not controlled by uh, a reasonably inexperienced driver. Uh, they're not running on a perfect surface that's uh, made of sandpaper. They're running on broken and rough and dusty asphalt and concrete and whatever. So there is in fact a better tire and I'll get to that later. Um, having said that, that tire may not be available to you in India anyway, so really doesn't matter in the long term of things. Okay. As I said, what's missing in the tire testing consortium is that human interface. And the tire that tests fastest on the test machine may well not be the best or the fastest tire at the event. Okay. Something that uh, we need to take into account here is the human interface. And you will always find that a tire that develops the most grip, either laterally or longitudinally, usually develops that grip over a very narrow band. That means the tire breaks away very easily. It means the tire is not progressive to drive on. The tire is very difficult to drive on and very easy to lose control, either locking up brakes uh, or, or spinning in corners or, or you know, the, the other issues that happen. Generally, radial ply tires uh, will break away more abruptly than a, than a bias ply tire. And that's a lot to do with the construction of the tire, which we probably don't need to talk about here. As I've said here, the stickiest tire is not necessarily the fastest tire. Okay, in recent years, there's been a significant move by teams away from 13 inch tires and towards 10 inch wheels and tires and towards 10 inch wheels and tires. There are reasons for this. Um, you know, a 10 inch wheel has obviously lower moment of inertia and is less effective as a gyroscope, as I was talking about before. 
it also tends to warm its compound up more quickly because the same bit of rubber hits the track more frequently than on a 13 inch, 13 inch wheel. However, there are downsides and my recommendation for a team that's inexperienced or still learning or who are budgetally challenged, in other words, got no money, which is almost every team, you should probably consider that the best choice for you is going to be a 13 inch wheel and tire. Okay, I know the mass and the uh, low mass of a 10 inch wheel is an advantage, but the big difference with a 13 inch wheel is there is more, uh, more room inside the wheel for a brake package and your caliper and all that sort of stuff. And also for the outboard ends of the, the suspension arrangement. Uh, if the team want to have a relatively short virtual swing axle length, it means that their wishbones are going to taper in from the outboard end to the inboard end. And that means that the inboard end, inboard pickups where the forces are reacted into the chassis get much closer together. And the closer together they are, the more difficult it becomes to make the chassis structure stiff and to resist the, resist the compliance that's going to, going to occur. Uh, this is why the you know, wishbone pickups mounted in the middle of unsupported tubes and whatever. The end result of that is that usually the toe compliance, particularly at the rear of the car, and the camber compliance is not good. In other words, the, the, the wheels self-steer themselves. Uh, and that just ruins the performance of any tire. But, you know, you knock the knock the corners off the off the, the tread or knock the corners off the tire, and the performance of the tire deteriorates quite quickly. Okay, a 13-inch wheel and tire will usually weigh more, and it will have a higher rotating inertia. Okay, we accept that, but that's not a good reason to reject this option. Okay. As I said, it offers more space for tires and better load pads for the suspension. However, 13-inch tires or suitable tires are also much more readily available. And there is also a, uh, the availability of cheap used tires. Now, I'm not talking about going down to the local wrecker and buying tires off a Tata Nano. What I'm talking about here is finding uh, competitive open wheel racers who run in you know, Formula BMW or uh, Formula JK or one of the other open wheel formulas that, that run, who run on race tires, uh, and they want to run on fresh tires every race meeting. What do they do with the old ones? Well, usually they just sell them off cheap. So if you can find somebody who does that, there's an option for cheap tires in that 13 inch or possibly even 15 inch size. I wouldn't reject a 15 inch wheel either. Okay, moving along a little more. Uh, I said, surely all these features, you know, we're talking now about fitting brakes and suspension inside the car. That's a good thing. However, the downside is rotational inertia and weight, or you reduce the rotational inertia and weight. All of those things, they, none of those things should be the primary choice of your tire. The primary choice of the tire is what's the bloody fastest on the racetrack? What tire goes quickest? An observation shows that these days, the new production that's over the last two years or thereabouts, new production 13 inch Goodyear Formula SAE tires are the best all around tires that's available. Now, jot that down in your notes. Maybe you need to go and find a search because if you can locate the, uh, the 13 inch uh, Goodyear tires in sizes that suit the car that you want to design, well, good luck in your search. I hope you do well. The other option, of course, is that they're wet weather tires. Not that we ever have had to use wet weather tires at Formula Barat, but their wet weather tires are also extremely good. So there's a, a, a real world tip. However, if those tires are not available, 
um, you have to choose or you have to get the best that you can get. Now, the key to good road holding, the key to making your tires work best is to keep the tire happy at the contact patch. So anything that you have in your car that upsets the tire, be that uh, a lack of concentricity or out of balance or various other things we'll talk about, anything that starts to shake, rattle and roll the tire at the contact patch will reduce the grip. Um, if this was a live uh, presentation, I would show you a little, uh, a little uh, demonstration that I make. I take a pencil with a, an eraser on it. I put it on a surface, put my finger on the top and lean it over. Apply a little pressure. So we now have the, the, the moment of my, uh, the force from my hand is being, re, it re, is being reacted by the, the, the tire surface. And if I then slap the surface, bang, the tire pops away because the vibration just broke the, the, the grip between that rubber eraser and the surface, the same as a, a vibration or a bump will break the adhesion between your tire and, uh, and, and the road surface. And this is particularly so in the wet because that little bump allows liquid between the tire and the road surface, which lubricates the joint and down goes, away well, goes the tire. Okay, before we move on, street wheels and tires. Okay, sometimes, so we see this a lot in India and in some other countries where the team either cannot find appropriate competition tires or can't afford them. And so they decide or, or they're forced to make a choice to use road tires, tires from a street car. Okay. Okay. You have to accept that um, if you have to make that decision, you all other things being equal, you're never, ever, ever going to beat a car on appropriate tires in the dynamic events. Um, that's a fact of life, you must learn to live with it. Um, street tires are way too heavy. Uh, having a steel belt, steel belted radials, their uh, gyroscopic effect is very, very high. They're designed to uh, last, you know, 100,000 kilometers or something on the road. Um, holding up a car that probably weighs four or five times as much as your little Formula Barrett car. So they're just an unsuitable tire. The problem then becomes that the tire is so stiff, even in its construction, that it patters on the road. That's generating little shocks that break the adhesion of the tire. So they've got less grip, um, less suitable, higher gyroscopic effect. There's a lot of, a lot of uh, reasons why it's, it's a sad, although sometimes necessary choice for a team to have to make. I'll just go back one slide. And I've shown that first slide shown on an alloy wheel. Next time you get the opportunity, I want you to pick up a bare alloy wheel from a streetcar and a bare steel wheel from a streetcar. And you will find that the alloy wheel is not lighter. It is far heavier, maybe a bit stiffer, but it's far heavier. So it's also far more expensive. So even for, even for teams who are, have a budgetary constraint and, but who can get some competition type tires, a street wheel, is often a very, very suitable solution rather than uh, forking out for expensive forged type, forged magnesium wheels suitable for racing. Another thing that we see sometimes is many teams who want to use center lock wheels because race car. Center lock wheels are used uh, where fast pit stops are necessary. I've never, ever, ever, ever seen a fast pit stop 
in Formula Student. Okay. A critical part, obviously, of keeping the tires happy relates to your spring and damper choice. The spring and damper's job is to moderate those bumps and, and pumps that actually make the uh, make the wheel jump away, lose traction. And we'll get back to that in due course because there are some clever little tricks around that you can use to make inexpensive dampers, you know, dampers that might just come off a off a street bike, a little street bike in uh, in India, actually make them work much better than their uh, than their design. Not not so much because the, the damper works better, but because you actually use it better. But I'll get back to that. We'll get to that in due course. Okay. The first thing to consider in keeping the tire happy is to ensure that the hub, the wheel, and the tire run true. By that means I want no axial or radial run out. The tire has to spin concentrically. And sometimes that may even mean that the tire needs to be skimmed. It's uh, not uncommon with, with race cars, so Formula Fords and things like that, that the wheels and tires are actually set up in a modified wheel balance machine that's used as a lathe. And they actually skim the tire to make sure that the tire is the tire tread, the part that runs on the road, is actually concentric with the with the, the stub. This means, of course, too. Excuse me, my seat's a bit uncomfortable. Um, it also means, of course, that uh, the wheel has to be centered. Needs to be some sort of spigot to center the wheel. Do not use the wheel studs or the wheel bolts to center your wheel. That's not a suitable way of doing it. The wheel will run out, and when it runs out, it will run out. The other thing, of course, that makes it run out is unbalance. Get the wheels balanced. It doesn't cost very much, but get the wheels balanced because uh, not only will the car be more pleasant to drive, but the wheels and tires work better. The other thing before we leave here is if you are forced to choose street tires, don't buy old tires from a, uh, from, from a, from a junkyard. Uh, you know, kick the can and organize sponsorship or, or whatever to find four brand new tires to put on the road. Because once you start using a tire, every time the tire is used, it gets warm. When it gets warm, it heat cycles. When it heat cycles, it just hardens up a little bit. It has less grip the next time. And if a tire is old and had many heat cycles through it, it's going to be as hard as concrete. And it's just not going to offer you any grip really at all. Okay, I've also said here that wheel attachment to the chassis must be free of unwanted compliance. Now, a place where we see compliance where the wheels attached to the chassis is in compliant uprights. So in other words, when a cornering force or rearing force is applied to the front wheel or the rear wheel, that the upright actually uh, flexes or, or deforms and allows the car to to take on, you know, unwanted camber or unwanted toe figures. There's also we see compliance at the other end of the suspension uh, attachments, like wishbone connections to the chassis, where we have uh, wishbone tubes attached to the chassis in the middle of an unsupported tube, not at a node, uh, so that the chassis can flex, or or they're bolted into a clevis that clevis can flex, Need, the car needs to be, this needs to be in that particular area, needs to be extremely stiff. Um, and a lot of that stiffness doesn't come from making things big and heavy and strong and ugly and, you know, using uh, big girders to make the car stiff. Some clever design can actually, means that when you have a look at when, where the forces are applied, you can actually make a stiff structure that's very light. People who make airplanes are extremely good at this. So let's have a look and I'll, I'll start at the back of the car because it's probably a little bit easier because we can talk about it easily in two dimensions. When we talk about the front of the car, we have to introduce steering. So I'll leave that till later. Okay. So before the chassis or the suspension uprights can be designed, the suspension general layout must be determined. Okay, so you need to, to, to you settle on your wheels, you choose your wheels, 
uh, design your uprights so that they fit wherever they want them to fit. And then you work out your geometry. And then the inboard points of that geometry tells you where the nodes in your chassis must be. If you've already built the chassis and now you have to adapt this uh, suspension to the chassis, and that means that the, uh, the suspension clevises pick up points have to go in a, in a less than appropriate position on the chassis. Well, you're starting off behind the eight ball. And not only will this affect you in the dynamic events, let me tell you, the design judges are not going to be very impressed either. Design judges hate this stuff, including me. Okay, moving along a little bit. So, I've said the rear suspension. So you've got the chassis and you've got, you know, the chassis is just a generic block over there. That's not the final, that's not the final chassis. That's just a pretend chassis. But we do have a model of our wheel out here. And this is where the elimination of particularly tow compliance and camper compliance at the rear of the car starts right here. Okay. The first thing you have to determine is where the center of pressure is. Okay, the center of pressure, obviously, in a you know tire that's going to be cambered negatively, in other words, tilted in at the top, is going to be inboard of the center of the tire tread. So all of those calculations that you've seen in many quite respected books that show uh, things like measuring scrub radius from the center of the tire, they're incorrect. That's not where the force is applied. The force is applied from the center of pressure. And so all those calculations should be made from the center of pressure. Uh, as a rough rule of thumb, I always say, do your calculations uh, one third of the way out from the inside edge of the tire or two thirds of the way in from the outside edge of the tire. And you're going to be very close. It's certainly not the center of the tire as you can see here. Okay, now, if your rear steer axis, and there is such a thing as the rear steer axis, because of the four bar linkage that you're going to make for your suspension is going to have an articulated link on the outside edge that has to be able to steer because you need to be able to adjust the toe, toe in or toe out. If that steer axis actually intersects the center of pressure, now there is no moment applied, there's no moment for a force applied from the wheel to actually try steer the, the, the wheel. If you, if you have a big moment here, you'll find that it's more difficult to control uh, rear toe unless you've got heavy duty suspension links and suspension pickups. So moving on, Starting with the lower transverse link, that's your lower wishbone. Try to make this as long as practical and parallel with the ground in the normal loaded position. Now, the reason for this is to reduce scrub at the contact patch as the wheel moves vertically. You don't want your wheel moving in and out as the wheel patters over little bumps. You want to try to keep it traveling as close to vertical as possible to stop upsetting the tire at the contact patch. No trick there. Okay. Then set your virtual swing axle length at about two or three track widths. That's not, not that important. There has been a, a Hang on, my leg stuck. That's been, there's been uh, a tendency in recent years to go to very short swing axle lengths. And in fact, we've actually seen cars with, with swing axle geometry, the so-called Lancaster links. Uh, but that's not necessary. And it also means that because of the short swing axle length, there will be a, a, a lateral movement of the wheel as it works. Uh, a swing axle length of about two to three track widths will give you the camber change that you need 
to keep your tire in its happy camber window uh, over the 50 millimeters or thereabouts of suspension travel that you're going to have on your uh, on your on your rear suspension. The rules require that you have a minimum of 50 millimeters. There's no reason to have any more than that, and uh, you certainly don't need 90 millimeters or 100 millimeters or various things that we've seen. Um, the way, the simplest way to uh, re restrict the, the, the minimum is to put a, uh, a bump rubber on the damper shaft to stop the damper traveling too far. Okay, moving on a little bit more. You can change the amount of camber gain. In other words, how much camber in the position of the inner pivot of the upper link. By making it shorter, you will get more camber change. By making it longer, you will get less camber change. So in your suspension kinematic design, you can figure out what it is you want and uh, get the camber change that you need without having to go to a, a very short virtual swing excellent. One thing you will notice here is I've made absolutely no comment about roll centers or roll axes. Uh, and that's deliberate uh, because in essence, if you make your lower control arm horizontal to the ground, automatically, your roll center is going to find itself somewhere in about the appropriate position. And to be quite honest, it's really not that important. Um, so a little bit like uh, the late Dr. Pajeka's tire magic, uh, roll centers, I'm sorry, but roll centers are a bit like magic too. Okay, moving on. As I said, you can determine where the roll center is, but don't fuss over it because the reason you shouldn't fuss over it is because any movement of anything causes the roll centers to shift. All you have to do is move the steering wheel five degrees left or right, and the roll axis in the car moves. So, uh, you know, the roll centers and the roll axis as determined by you with a static car at the design stage means absolutely nothing when the, tire is, when the car is, is driving. More important to look after your tire here at the contact patch. This is where it all happens. That's where you've got to baby your tires. Okay. You're going to need at the rear of the car, either some parallel links or a tow control link in order to, to prevent tow of the rear at the rear of the car. Now, that can be at the top or the bottom of the upright. Uh, usually, if you put it at the bottom of the upright, it makes it a little bit more difficult to make a stiff upright, but it makes it easier uh, load path for your push rods or your, uh, or your um, direct acting tappers or, or whatever the case may be, whatever it is you're doing. Uh, if you mount it the other way, with, in other words, with the uh, with the parallel links at the top, uh, that usually results in a stiffer upright, uh, but the uh, makes it a bit more difficult to uh, to adopt to to use your suspension system. I want a picture here of how the real guys do it. This is a a Dallara IndyCar top wishbone toe control link and the bottom wishbone you can't really see but it's it's down there it's just a wishbone that picks up in the middle so you can see this dimension here critically important you make that dimension as wide as possible that's the toe base and that's something that every design judge will look at because we know that a good wide and stiff toe base makes usually for the makings of a good handling car Narrow little toe bases mean that the, the car can bump and roll steer, compliance steer, and so that car will be will be difficult to drive accurately and uh, and slow. Hello. Sorry, that was the oh. accident part. Please continue. Yeah, no, no, that's okay. 
Okay. Um, we're now talking about the rear suspension uh, and we're going to now add the drive shafts. Um, drive shafts with hook joints, that's the ordinary standard universal joints, generate vibrations. And as we've agreed, vibrations upset the tire contact patch. So you're better off with some form of constant velocity joint. You also should organize or should arrange that the drive shafts should be in a parallel to the ground uh, layout with the car in the normal loaded condition. In other words, that there is no forces being fed round corners in the drive shafts under most normal conditions. Okay. Uh, what this will do, of course, is this will set the position of the final drive in the chassis. So this tells you where your differential is going to have to be because that's going to be mounted up and down here somewhere. One thing you might gather from this is that you can't really design the chassis until you've got all this other stuff sorted out. So the chassis, the, a major mistake we see by, by uh, inexperienced teams is that they design the chassis first and then they have to try patching stuff on to make it fit. Whereas basically you should design all the stuff that you've got to patch on first and then design the chassis to make it fit. Because after all, the chassis is really only, excuse me, it's really only a complicated bracket that holds everything in the car together. And you cannot design a, an effective bracket unless you know what you actually want to bracket together. So all of this suspension stuff and geometry stuff, all that sh should come first before your final chassis design. You can have a general layout of how you want to layer the chassis, but where the tubes actually lie, where the nodes actually are, all of that should come after you've designed where you want the forces to be applied to that chassis. Okay, you can see now there's a complication and that is that the drive shafts are going to pass through a different arc than your wheels. That means that the drive shafts want to change length as the suspension operates. And if you don't allow for that, here's another source of vibration and harshness and all those other things. So the best solution here, and it's a very easy solution, is instead of using hook joints like universal joints, use tripods. And tripods are readily available on any little four wheel, uh, sorry, front wheel drive car on the market. Uh, they are a form of constant velocity joint and they have the ability to absorb plunge as well as absorb uh, angular change. And they don't have the uh, changes in rotational acceleration that a hook joint has. Uh, these things are, you know, you're looking here at possibly, you know, designing a rear drive from the front drive of a, of a little car and using its plug-in, uh, we call these tulips, because that's what they look like, the lift flower that's a tulip, plug-in tulips, and then you can organize the axle with a tripod joint to fit it. Sometimes they're called tripods, but you'll see them on the front of, front of any little car out there in the marketplace, have been for 10 years or more. Okay, as I said, you should avoid using cardan joints or hook joints. They're not constant velocity joints, as you can see in the animation. They speed up and they slow down and they speed up and they slow down. Uh, this change in angular velocity causes vibrations uh, and where, where the shaft is operated through an angle, but also does not deliver the engine torque in smooth, smoothly to the tires. And so once again, we're upsetting the tire contact patch much more to this than you might have thought. Okay, we've talked about the back of the car. Let's go to the front of the car. And realistically, it's no different. We're going to draw the front suspension, uh, you know, with the, with the lower, uh, lower control arm, as long as practical and parallel with the ground for exactly the same reason as we did at the back. That is in order to, to reduce as much as possible, the amount of lateral scrub of the tire as the suspension works. 
Okay. Draw a line from there and from the center of your contact patch. Remember the contact patch, not the center of the dar. Out. In this case, your virtual swing axle length should be just a little longer than the rear. You don't need quite as much camber change on the front. I'll come to that in a minute. So about three track widths is about the right number there. And then draw it back to your top suspension. Now, unlike at the rear of the car where we didn't want any scrub radius, at the front of the car, yes, we do. We want to have scrub radius from the center of the contact patch to where the uh, steer axis intersects the ground. We need a small amount of, of um, uh, move, uh, radius there. And the reason for that is primarily to give the driver some feedback. If you have all of the moment taken away, the driver has no feel. So you need to actually give the driver a little bit of work to do as he drives the car. Um, if the team have chosen to run a spool drive, that's to say a solid rear axle, not a differential in the back of the car, they actually should have a little bit more scrub radius because now they're actually going to use the scrub along with uh, some weight jacking that happens from the caster, I'll come back to it later, to actually make the car uh, weight shift to allow the spool to, to work. That's a whole other subject, an important one, but it's a whole other subject. The reason why we don't need quite so much camber change on the front of the car is because the caster angle that we've got in the car will cause the loaded that's the outside front wheel to go into a, an amount of negative camber just from steering. So you get a little bit of help from the caster that you didn't have at the back. So you don't need as much kinematic uh, camber change at the front as you did at the back because the caster helps you. Um, hence, hence uh, I said two and a half times uh, the track width at the back and about three times the track width of the front. Once again, of course, you can change the uh, change the um, amount of camber change you get by changing the position of the inner uh, ball ball joint on the on the top suspension, like the top top wishbone, whatever you wish to call it. Okay, that looks complicated, doesn't it? That's because it is. The additional complication when designing the front suspension is to ensure that the steering geometry is compatible. In other words, you want the steering linkage to pass through a complementary arc to the suspension linkage. Otherwise, you get a phenomenon which is called roll steer or bump steer. That is to say, as the suspension works or the car rolls, the steering operates. Now, in small amounts, it's not such a huge deal. And the reason I say it's not such a huge deal is because there is a correction device. It's called the steering wheel and the driver's attached to it. So the driver can actually correct small changes in, in steering angle by tweaking the steering wheel a little bit. However, it's not a good thing. Um, one thing that makes it particularly not a good thing is if you have toe out or toe in as the car bumps or droops. So in other words, if the, if the driver stands on the brakes and the wheels splay out away from each other as the suspension works because of the bump steer, that's gonna murder your tires. It's gonna murder the inside edge of the tires because the toe out means the car will, yeah, anyway. Okay. Now, in order to avoid upsetting the tire contact patch, I have avoided where possible complex motions like anti-dive or anti-squat geometry. Don't use it. All of these uh, geometries, regardless of what system you use, all are binding mechanisms. And what they do is they remove the road load away from the springs 
and they put it into the suspension links. Uh, suspension links don't uh, allow the wheel to follow the road irregularities. Bump, 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 upset the tire contact patch. And uh, the result is that we have, again, a, a long, a, an unhappy tire at the contact patch. There is another way, and that is to use third elements, like, a, in other words, a bump spring, additional bump spring, or an anti-squat spring at the back of the car, uh, so that you introduce a third spring, so the spring handles the bumps in bump or in, or in, or in drive. I'll cover that a little later. There, I've got some examples later in the, in the presentation to show you. But anti-dive, anti-squat all sounds like it's more of that bloody black magic. You know, put it over there in the pile with, you know, roll centers and Pajeka, whatever. There's lots of you know. other things that you may hear while I'm on the subject of black magic. When somebody tells you the trick is what they're trying to do is they don't know. If if they know it's not a trick. So when somebody says, Oh, the trick is don't allow the roll center to pass through the ground plane or some other bullshit. Uh, ignore it. That's not important. That's, again, more stuff to put over there in the pile. Okay. Now I'm going to talk about looking after the tires when they're not on the car. And this is every bit as important. Very first thing is when you've driven the car and the tires are hot and you come into the pits, immediately pick the car up off the ground and put it on stands. If you don't have stands, make some. Uh, if you leave the car to sit on the ground on hot tires, they will develop flat spots. And it's going to take, you know, maybe four or five laps until the tires come up to temperature again to get those flat spots out. Flat spots make the tires go bumpity bumpity bump and tires going bumpity bumpity bump are not happy tires. Second thing you should do is immediately deflate the tires. So the car comes in off the track, pick it up, put it on stands and let the tires down. Why? Because the expansion of the air inside the tires cools the tires and takes away any heat, which reduces the effect of heat cycling the tire. Remove the valves, give the refrigeration effect. Now, when the tire is cool, you take a rasp, like a, bit, a rough file, and remove any dead rubber or pick up from the tire. Get rid of that. So smooth it down so the tire is, is ready to go. Um, when, you, um, when you're ready to go racing again, you inflate your tires and you're all ready to go on effectively almost new tires. Okay. Don't allow the car to sit on the tires. Uh, that's what I'm talking now about taking it back to the back to your garage or sitting in your school and you just leave the car sitting on its tires. Uh, put it on stands or or if you're going to leave it sit on wheels and tires, just use some old junk wheels and tires that, that you don't care about. Not your good race tires. Okay. It is best to lightly scrub the tires in before you use them in competition. So if you've spent a lot of money and you've bought some expensive tires, particularly, you want to take them on the track and do half a dozen laps or so at a medium pace. Don't skid on them, don't slide them, don't abuse them. You then come in, pick the car up, take the, uh, deflate the tires, clean them up. Well, they won't need cleaning, but uh, take the wheels and tires off and allow them to rest for at least 24 hours. Um, you know, you'll see, you know, if you're watching formula stuff for uh, motorsport, you know, the real races, they want to go out on sticker tires because they go fast. And that's true. The fastest lap that a tire will ever do is the first lap out of the pits on sticker tires. However, that's abuse of the tire and you've actually sucked out an enormous amount of the life of that tire in an effort to gain 
you know, a tenth of a second or something, because you're trying to beat Lewis Hamilton to pole position on the grid. Uh, where your tire will now suffer is down the road. Uh, it won't have the life. Its performance will fall off quicker. That first vicious heat cycle will knock the tires around. Okay, looking after tires, storing the tires. When you're back at the ranch and you put your tires, like you, you store your tires, you keep them away from light, especially fluorescent light, fluoro lights. The UV content in fluoro lights will damage the tire compound. It's not rubber. It will damage the tire compound and harden it. So I recommend that you seal them in black garbage bags. You know, the ones that go in the bin, just put them in there, maybe suck the air out, tie a knot in them and store them somewhere cool and safe. Now you need to keep them away from ozone generators because ozone will also attack the tire. So this means that you do not keep them well away from compressors, generators, fridges, even fridges, like many fridges have a little electric motor in there. And each time they spark up, they generate ozone and that ozone will actually go into the tire. And I'll show you a sample of ozone affected tire in, in, in a little while. Most certainly keep them away from welders. Um, you know, the welding, welding on the tire with tires on it is not a good idea. Welding in the workshop while the tires are unprotected, not a good idea. The ozone will knock the daylights out of your tires. Okay, so I'll just reiterate all of that stuff. You've got your brand new, you've managed to find a set of these magic Goodyears. Okay, first thing you do is you put them on the car, you do half a dozen laps at a moderate pace, not slow, moderate pace, because you want to scrub off, scrub off the, the mold release uh, material. They put a kind of wax on the tire so it will come out of the mold at the factory more easily. You want to get rid of that because that's a lubricant. And also you want a very mild heat cycle. So uh, the, the long chain polymers in the tire just need a little bit of settling down and resetting. You then need to let the tire rest and not just overnight, it needs to rest for a minimum of sort of 24 hours. Two days is even better if needs be. But, uh, you know, going, going out fast and hard on new tires or fitting new tires, brand new fresh uh, sticker tires for the event is just going to murder them in the long term. You know, you'll find that by the time you've reached the end of the, uh, the endurance event, that the tires will have gone away you know, the, the, the grip's gone. It just doesn't, doesn't work that way. Okay. Next thing is inflation. Obviously, in your testing, you need to determine what the best inflation pressure is when the tires are hot. Okay. We'll talk about measuring that in a few minutes. If the air that you've used to inflate the tires is not dry, you'll find that the steam that will be generated or the water vapor that will be generated inside the tire will cause a significant increase in tire temperature when the tires get hot, makes the tires unstable, makes them hard to use. Also, it may well damage the wheels because you get corrosion. Air from most compressors is wet. The reason it's wet is that you suck in air from the from the atmosphere. It has a humidity content. That humidity content builds up and, and eventually literally becomes standing water inside the compressor tank. That compressors need to be depressurized and drained regularly. Uh, you'd be amazed even after only maybe a week's work that you could very well get half a liter of water coming out from the drain on the, on the, on the tank. Um, that water is the, is, is the enemy of, of uh, good tire pressure. A better solution, if you can get it, is dry nitrogen that comes from a welding supplier, inert gas. It's dry, it's stable. Um, its molecular structure means that it actually maintains uh, pressure better than uh, better than does um, 
does air. And remember, air is 70 something percent nitrogen anyway. So, uh, however, nitrogen might be expensive, but some, some gas suppliers actually sell a thing that they call tire gas. What tire gas is, is nitrogen that's been corrupted. In other words, somebody's decanted it into a, into a, a container that previously might have had argon in it or some other gas. So it's been corrupted and it can no longer be sold as, as nitrogen. So they sell it as tire gas. Um, it's, uh, that, that's useful if, if your tire supplier does that. You're not going to find that from the corner tire guy who, you know, who fixes punctures. That, that will be from a, a major tire outlet. Okay, so looking after the tires. So ensure the compressor is drained regularly. You use a water trap in the supply line. That's something else that should be done. All compressors should have a water trap in the supply line so that the water is actually drained, or most of the water is drained from the air as it's supplied to the, to the compressor. Or as I've said, use dry nitrogen from oil and gas supplier. Important. Okay, now we're going to talk about monitoring tire pressures. There's a lovely uh, electronic tire pressure monitor device that uh, comes from Rotex, the go-kart people. Um, I'm not suggesting for a minute that you should have such a thing, but it monitors, you're able to monitor tire temperatures and tire pressures all at the same time. Okay, tire temperature measurement. Don't don't rely on an infrared heat measurement. Um, they only measure the surface temperature of the tire, it measures the infrared heat emitted from the surface of the tire, and that dissipates very quickly. Uh, and also doesn't give us a true indication of the temperature in the core of the, of, of the, the compound. So you need a proper pyrometer with a, with a needle probe um, and that probe is inserted into the thread in three places. And you can manage your pressures and your camber and toe settings by understanding what the temperatures should be or how they should be as you measure across the tire. Go back one. You can make or buy notepads to record, record tire temperatures and pressures. Uh, this is important because you'll forget, you'll forget. And you'll also find that, you know, things change when you're out testing. You need, one of the temperatures you want to measure is the temperature of the track, because obviously the temperature of the track is going to be, uh, going to have an effect on the, on the tread temperature in your tire. Uh, I've said here that the temperature should be slightly higher on the inner edge, decreasing slightly at the center and at the outer edge. Uh, look a little further into that in a minute. Now, there used to be an old rule of thumb when I was involved in motor racing years ago that the optimum tire, optimum temperature for slick tires was around 100 degrees Celsius. Although this number is very high for former student type tires. So I would be thinking that the optimum pressure would be, you know, in the 80, 85 degree range for competition tires. And if you're running on street tires, you're probably not going to get them much over 60 degrees. I see that uh, these days the Formula One tires, they're getting them to 160 degrees Celsius. But we also see Formula One tires fall to bits very quickly in, in the current era. So we don't need to go there. Um, overheating tires will cause them to blister. And again, I'll show you pictures in a while. Okay, that's where you should measure your tires, your probe points. One on the, just on the inside edge of the start of the thread, one in the middle, and one on the other side at the end of the thread. Insert the probe at an angle and to a depth of about one or two millimeters into the thread, but be careful you don't puncture the tire. It's very easy to push that, remember the rubber is going to be soft when it's hot, very easy to push that probe at the wrong angle straight into the tire and oops, end up with a puncture. Okay. Um, you can determine overinflation if the middle of the tire reads too high, it's too hot. Um, you know, if this, this sensor here, this measurement here is high, um, 
or if it's too low, if they're outside, yeah, you, you'll, you'll work it out. The other thing is you've got to do this fairly quickly because the, the tire temperatures dissipate away very quickly and uh, you need to measure, measure them pretty quickly. Okay, let's talk about tire wear. Okay, the sort of wear, what, what this stuff tells you. What I've got here is an example of a formula student tire and you can see that where the red arrow shows that the inside edge of the tire has worn a cup, it's worn a, a, little, a little groove. And the cupping wear on, and the wave pattern of this tire is caused by the team having an aggressive camber setting. It's not an effect of the incorrect toe setting. Otherwise, running between the corners would erase these marks. Um, what's happened is that the car has aggressive uh, camber as the driver drives into the corner, caster rather, as the driver turns into the corner, the tire tilts over on its inside edge and the cornering forces are fed into the tire on that inside edge and have excessively worn just this inside, you know, 40 millimeters or thereabouts of the tire. It's also cooked that part of the tire. The only option that you really would have there would be to peel that tire off and turn it over and put it the other way around on the rim. But in all honesty, the tire really has reached the end of its end of its competitive life because the car the tire has been abused by having incorrect settings, and it's never going to be never going to be as fast again. This is a tire you'd roll it over on the rim so that the unused outer portion became the inner portion. You might reduce the caster in the car a little bit, or or maybe just the static camber, and then uh, practice use it as a practice or a training tire. Okay. Camber wear. Here we have a tire that's worn by excessive negative camber, or the suspension kinematics resulted in excessive camber gain, or there's another possibility. It might well be that uh, compliance in the suspension or in the upright might have allowed the car to gain excessive camber. You'll notice on this one, we don't have the waves on the tire, but we do have some cupping and we've managed to run the inside edge of the tire up into like a little peak of rough rubber, which you can just really just remove with your, with your finger by rub your finger along it. Again, this tire is in not quite, but very nearly the same condition as the last tire we saw. Uh, it's effectively reached the end of its really competitive life. You certainly wouldn't start a Formula Student event on this tire. Okay. This is what happens if you go gung-ho on brand new tires, okay? If you trash the new tires, your sticker tires really fast, you're trying to do a Lewis Hamilton and set pole position, so you go out there. And this happens especially on the rear tires of electric cars because electric cars develop their torque at stall. So the bulk torque that wants to spin that wheel happens just as the driver tips in the accelerator pedal and that just tears up the tire. Well, to tear up a tire like that, you can see that also makes it hot. Uh, so it's, it's ripped off, it's ripped off tread. And uh, it's also given it a fairly savage heat cycle. So that's not, yeah, that's not a good way to treat your tires. As I've said down here on the bottom of that slide, properly bedded tires, as I explained before, will be faster and more stable over the long run. What we got next? Whoa, okay. This sort of grainy of tires when the tire is overloaded in shear, especially before the tire is fully warmed up. And it usually happens because the tire chosen is too soft for the, for the application. Um, not going to see too much of that in India, I don't think, but we certainly do see it in some places where teams will get hold from a, from a, a, a tire company, they'll get hold of some wet weather, soft wet weather tires that have not been great, grooved because many of those wet tires are actually grooved manually. So they get, so the tire is still slick. The rubber is made of gumbo rubber and then they take it out 
on a hot track and proceed to give it, give it the berries, as they say, give it one up. The tire is not fully warmed up and they're literally starting to tear the tire apart. And that if ever a driver does that to your tires, sack him, just kick him out. You don't need that. I mean, that's just, you know, there's a, you know, a $200 tire that's just been ripped to shreds for no good reason. Okay. If it's not too bad, this tire might clean up. You might be able to let it cool down and, and lay into it with a rasp and cut all that rubbish away until you have something approaching a, a reasonable looking tire. But of course, you've taken half the tread rubber away and it's had a massive heat cycle. So it's never going to be any good, but at least it'll be usable, a practice tire. Okay. This is a, a tire, this, this is the sort of tire that we see that comes off the, the fast guys. Okay, this is a Hoosier. You can see it started to grain. It's, it's close to, but not over the point of, of being abused. It's had a very aggressive heat cycle um, and a significant level of its competitors has been lost at this stage. So in other words, this fast guy has gone out and they've taken the most out of that tire to get the best time in the run that they want, knowing full well that the tire is, that they're consuming the tire. They don't have any thought of, of uh, keeping, like saving the tire because literally they've got another set just down the road. Okay, here we've got a tire that exhibits the symptoms from an understeering car. So if you've got a car understeering, so the driver is having to turn in too much. The tire is skinny on the inside edge of the tire and starts to grind up the inside edge of the tire. Understeer is slow and consumes tires. Uh, that's a setup issue. You know, you need to work on that. And that comes from uh, testing and, and experience. Okay, there's a tire. That tire is on a car. Uh, in the Australian competition one year when we had uh, temperatures of about 40 degrees Celsius. The track was too hot to walk on in your bare feet. And some of the drivers went out and, and in essence, they had, no, uh, they had no option. They brought the tires, this is an American car. They had no option. They had to go out on the tires that they had, which were too soft for the competition. And basically they've ruined, destroy the tire. Again, this was an uncut wet weather tire used on a very hot surface. It's done the job, but it's gone. It's finished. Okay. Here's a tire that's been overheated and blistered. Again, the cause was a tread compound that was too soft, but I would also suspect that this tire probably was inflated with wet air because it's blown up in the middle. You can see these little blisters What's happened is that the the gases that are, are generated in the in the in the in the tire compound actually have bubbled up and made blisters, and the top of the blisters have worn off, and so you end up with these pits and holes in the tire. And although the tire is not particularly overused, or maybe not even abused, but it's um, yeah, it, it's just again a, an indication of going too hard too hot, a tire abuse, which needs to be abused. And of course that tire, you can't, you can't, um, you can't rasp away those blisters because they go all the way to the bottom of the tread. Okay, here's the thing to note. Tires, some tires will have an arrow on the side telling you which direction they must rotate on the car. And this usually changes from the front to the back because front tires have to resist brake torque, rear tires have to resist drive torque. The tread, when, it's, when the tire's been made, the tread has been lapped over. And if you drive the tire the wrong way, it may be that the tire splice will start to open. Um, I mean, you can still drive on this tire, but you can see that it's not going to give optimal performance. And in fact, will get much worse. Uh, so it's important to note that if the tires have directional arrows on them, that you obey those arrows when fitting the tires on the wheel 
or when fitting the wheels of the car. Okay. Uh, yep, another tire which has been run hot. And you can see this tire will, this tire will turn into wood in its, if it's, it's just been, that's just been, the plasticizers have been boiled off. It's just been used up, it's worn out effectively. There's a wet weather tire used in dry conditions, which is overheated, balled up, that's caused issues. Uh, that team, I remember they taught under the conditions that there was an advantage for them to use their wet weather tires in the autocross event, the one lap event. They thought, oh, just in one lap, the soft wet tires will give them an, uh, uh, give them a, uh, uh, an advantage. What happened was that the tires overheated, became slimy. There was no advantage; it had to be all, had to be at, no advantage to be had at all, and they overheated and destroyed their wet weather tires. Fortunately for them, it didn't rain in the event because trying to run this tire in the wet would have been a disaster. Okay, look after your tires when you're rolling the car around or moving the car around. Cover the tires. Uh, some teams make uh, covers, material sew-up covers. Others just wrap them with saran wrap or glad wrap or whatever you call it in your part of the country. That stops the hot tires picking up um, picking up stones or pebbles or many is the puncture that's been picked up because a team have rolled over a self-tapping screw that's fallen off an opposition car or, or a rivet or some such thing. So you can keep that stuff out of the tire. It's looking after your tires. Okay, that's what they should look like. Okay, as you can see a nice even gray grain across the tire. That tire has been used well, the car has been set up well, and that team have had a good day. Okay, now these are tires that have been demounted and stored without being cleaned. And the blue sheen is evidence of the tires, the plasticizers leaching out of the rubber and probably caused by uh, um, exposure to uh, either UV light or to um, uh, or to ozone from from a, an electric motor, you could clean these tires up and use them again, but <laughs> they're not going to be fast. Uh, you know they've been they've been abused purely by being stored incorrectly. These tires should have been cleaned as soon as they came off the car. It should have been bagged up and put somewhere cool, away from ozone and away from UV light. UV light and the sun too. Keep them out of the sunlight. Another on the same topic, if you're buying tires from a vendor, don't buy the tires that have been on display in the shop window because they've been exposed to, uh, to the UV light and the sunshine. Okay, word of warning, do not use tire softening fluids. We have teams that use them. Um, they're not permitted. Uh, very popular with car, or they were years ago with carters. These days they're all banned. What they attempt to do is they attempt to put back into the tire rubber the plasticizers that overheating the tires has boiled off. But it doesn't really work that way. Uh, excess use can cause tire failure like that. In this case, these tires were soaked in an excess amount of time and literally. The, the solvent has broken the bond between the tire, uh, the tire tread and the canvas, the, the, the carcass underneath. Um, that could kill you, okay? Okay, time to talk about dampers a little bit. Obviously the dampers, there's not gonna be, this is not going to be an in-depth, how you use your dampers thing. It's, um, okay, what I'm saying is the majority of teams who use bell cranks in formula student, opt for a one-to-one -one motion ratio. But in fact, they don't have a one-to-one -one ratio. The actual ratio between wheel travel and push rod or pull rod or direct stacking shock is usually more like 0.6 to one. Uh, this means that over a 25 millimeter bump, the damper shaft only travels about 15 millimeters. So over a five millimeter bump, the, the damper shaft will only move about three millimeters. And in three millimeters, the dampers can't work. Uh, you know, the washers and the valve will really be, only be rattling the washers on their seats. The damper is not really working 
and those high frequency pitter patters that don't get damped out upset the tower contact patch. Formula student dampers typically have about 75 or 80 millimeters of travel, yet the designer uses only about half that. You know, 75 or 80 multiplied by 0.6. That's unless the designer specified more than the minimum of 50 millimeters of wheel travel, and you really shouldn't do that. Okay, if you're using direct acting suspension, there's very little you can do about this, but there are some sneaky workarounds that I'll show you in a minute. Um, other particularly manufacturers of production race cars sometimes get away with using fairly ordinary shock absorbers but with a linkage that makes them work much better. Okay, there is a, uh, there is a, a, a typical direct acting uh, application of a Cane Creek damper on a Formula student car. Uh, nothing wrong with that. That's about as good as you're gonna get. They have a little bump stop in here. Uh, to, yeah, that, that, that's pretty tidy arrangement. However, it's not, going to make optimum use of the damper, but at least they're using very good quality dampers. Back in the 60s and 70s, when direct acting suspension was how you did it, dampers were fairly crude. The popular Coney dampers at the time could only be adjusted by removing from the car, stripping them down and adjusting them on the workbench. What you did was you strip them down, you push the shaft all the way to the bottom, the bottom of the shaft engaged with a valve in the bottom of the damper and you could click back or forth and find the setting that you wanted. You could not change bump and, and rebound individually. What you had is what you had. What happened in most cases was people went all the way one direction, all the way in the other direction, back to the middle and left them like that and, and just made do with the damping performance that they had. And that was state of the art in the 60s and 70s. That's, that's what we did. Okay, in the 70s, the motocross riders in particular discovered the advantages of long travel suspension. You could go faster over the big whoop de doos and big jumps and tabletops and all that if you could get a lot of travel because that travel gave you better traction to drive because it kept the wheel on the ground. Okay, they got more travel generally by laying the dampers forward at an angle. You can see here on this factory Suzuki, the dampers have been moved forward on the swing axle and laid forward at an angle. And so these dampers are not being used. These dampers probably had uh, about six inches of shaft travel and the wheel probably had uh, probably 12 inches. You know, so. 150 millimeters of shaft travel in the damper for 300 millimeters of wheel travel on the bike. Okay. This had the same detrimental effect as we're dealing with the direct acting shocks and whatever on the car. Okay, we've talked about that. Now, this forced the development of new damper systems and the Olin's brand emerged from these as being the best and most respected maker of dampers, and they still are to this day. And in fact, the Cane Creek Formula Student dampers are in fact Olin's dampers. All bikers came up with a mechanical solution to make it work, but at the time, in the early 70s, the best was Suzuki's full floater system. This was a clever system where they compressed the damper from both ends. So in other words, it uh, if they had uh, 100 millimeters of travel at the wheel, they got 50 millimeters of travel on one end of the damper and 50 millimeters of travel on the other end of the damper. So they had 100 millimeters of damper travel, which meant that the valves had plenty of ability to operate properly. You could have progressive damping rates, made it much better. Only problem was somebody had a patent on the full floater system. Suzuki were sued and they had to pay that man millions because they had to pay a royalty for every motorcycle they sold with that system. And they had to cease and desist and not do it anymore. So that system is gone. But in essence, how it worked was here, oops, I got my cursor working. Here is the swing axle and it's pivoted at this end. Okay, there's a, a, a rocker or a bell crank here. 
operated by two push rods. Those push rods operate that top of the damper, push the damper down, but the damper is also mounted to the swing axle here. So it's actually squeezed between the top and bottom. That's why it was called full floater because the damper floated between the systems. Could we adapt such a system to a formula student car? Of course we could. Um, we'll give you some examples in a minute. And talking about bell cranks, the students don't do a good job of either implementing or justifying the bell cranks or the rockers on their, on their suspension. Often when we ask why they're using push rods or pull rods or bell cranks or whatever, uh, you get a smart ass answer and that doesn't impress the judges. If you're going to use an indirect acting suspension system on your car, you better know why, because the judge is going to ask you and he wants a proper considered answer. Okay, uh, there is the opportunity with bell cranks, of course, to change the ratio between wheel travel and damper travel, because the bell crank doesn't have to be symmetrical or close to being symmetrical, yet most are. As you can see here, looking at this, at, at the, the, the bell crank, the dimension from the pivot to the push rod point and the dimension from the pivot to the actuating point on the damper is pretty well the same. A little bit different, but pretty well the same. Whereas if this was much greater, the damper would travel much farther, the springs could be much lighter, and the damping could be much more effective and use more of it. Uh, the other thing is here, we have like long push rods. We have the necessity for an additional node in the chassis way up away from the suspension and an additional node in the chassis to take the suspension loads. Plus we've raised the center of gravity, increased the moment of inertia and roll. A judge is not going to be impressed by a design like that. Even though you yeah. might think it looks strict, that's, that's not an impressive design. How other people do it. This is a store race car. Now store make little sports cars, racing sports cars in the US and they sell hundreds of them. They race in series all over the US. And what they've done is they've adapted the type of suspension that Suzuki had with their full floater, but in a different way. What they've got here is they have a push rod from the bottom outer end of the, of the belt of the uh, wishbone, bottom wishbone. This push rod operates a bell crank, but the bell crank operates in a different, uh, operates transversely, not, uh, sorry, longitudinally, not transversely. And it compresses one end of the coil spring damper, but the other end of the coil spring damper is actually connected to the push rod. So this damper is actually floating. It's being compressed from both ends. So by using a fairly cheap budgetary uh, damper, store are able to uh, to generate uh, quite good, quite good damper performance uh, by by the linkage, and there's no reason why a Formula student, Formula Barat team couldn't use a, a linkage like that in their suspension. I'm not telling you that's what you should do. I'm only showing you that there are other options. Okay, here we have another system. This one comes from an English sports car manufacturer, same deal, like, like store, Radical make little sports cars for a series, and the Radical cars are sold all over the world, including the US. They have a coil spring damper unit, which is actually uh, pivots from the outer end of the bottom, uh, bottom uh, wishbone. But if you have a look, you'll find that the bell crank actually pivots, and it's operated by a push rod. So again, we have a floating coil spring and damper. Um, the damper is compressed from the bottom by the wishbone. It's compressed by the top by the bell crank, which in fact is operated from the wishbone. So once again, we have approximately a two to one multiplication of damper shaft travel for suspension travel, which makes again, uh, fairly average dampers perform quite good dampers purely because you're using more shaft travel, you're pumping more fluid, uh, you're giving the valves a uh, better opportunity to, to, to operate as valves. Uh, this car also has a, whoops, let me just go back. This car obviously has a, a very tricky um, uh, 
uh, anti-roll system, but I'm not going to talk about that today. This is another version, another version, but the same system. As you can see, the damper attached to the lower wishbone operates. Here's the pivoting. Here's the pivoting uh, bell crank. The push rod operates from down here, operates the bell crank, and so this damper floats. Uh, this car also has rod ends loaded in bending, but we won't talk about that today. If you're not aware, rod ends loaded in bending, putting, putting bending loads through the shaft of a threaded clevis or rod end is a mortal sin. Uh, the, the judge will castigate you if you do that. Don't do that. Okay. Back to push rods and pull rods. As I said, one of the main advantages of bell cranks is the ability to multiply the travel. Uh, and this is the benefit that most teams just don't use. We do have some uh, slides, because I'm coming close to the end now. We have some slides. This shows you a space frame race car. It's actually a Pikes Peak hill climb car. It's got nothing to do with Formula Student, but it's a professional car. And it's shown here because the bell crank ratios are what are used in mainstream motorsport. And it also has a third element. Remember I said earlier on, don't use anti-dive or anti-squat. Consider the use of third element as a, as a bump spring and or a squats anti-squat spring. Well, that's also used on this car. So we shall have a look there. Okay, so we're looking here at the front of the car, looking towards the back. You can see the radiators mounted on the side. Push rods are here. The bell crank is here. Now look at the bell crank ratio, the, the rocker ratio. So you have around about five to one rocker ratio, which means that for a little bit of a bump, you know, five, what we would call a stutter bump in motocross, the damper actually travels quite a long way. Okay. It also has uh, to explain the, um, the, uh, how the, how the third spring works. It also has these rods which come from the from the uh, from the bell crank they operate this t piece this is a pivot here they operate this t piece and this t piece is mounted to a vertical torsion bar which is the anti roll bar so as the car rolls this push rod would be pushed forward that one would be pulled back that twists this bar which resists roll however this bar is pivoted horizontally at the bottom which means that as a sus both suspension like in bump or droop, this can move back or forth. So when the driver stands on the brakes, as the suspension compresses on both sides, it pulls both of the rods backwards, which compresses this spring and damper, which resist the car diving in roll. And the back of the car is the same. It has a, an anti-squat that resists. So here's our now this one's probably got even more aggressive uh, bell crank ratio. It's looked like about six to one. Uh, so a very small bump moves the damper a long way. And here's the pull rods, or push rods, whatever they, they call them, to again a T-type T anti-roll bar, which is pivoted at the bottom. That's on a, on a, a it's a Pikes Peak hill climb car, but the lessons are still there. They're, you know, Google is, a, is your friend. You go looking for pictures and don't just look at pictures of, um, of Formula Student and Formula SAE cars because that just breeds monkey see, monkey do. Oh, everybody else does it, so we got to do it too. No, there are lots of lessons to be learned out there. Okay, this is a West sports car from the US. And once again, you can see here's the push rod, here's the bell crank ratio, massive. Uh, uh, aggressive um, bell crank ratio to adjust the springs. In this case, here's the T-bar and your roll bar. Here's the push rod that operates it. And this in fact is the spring. It's not really a spring. It's a, a stack of Belleville spring washers being used as spring, but it's in essence the same system. Okay, 87 slides is enough for this presentation. And what I've tried to show you this afternoon is there are many aspects to keeping your tires happy. Happy tires make for a fast car. It's easy to set up, easy to drive, and hopefully one that can collect you a trophy or two. But back to happy. 
your long, long train trip for many teams and they can party all the way home. Okay, thank you very much, Kathy. I'll give it all back okay, to you. Thank you for the session, Pat. Uh, participants, we're now going to open the Q&A session. Hello there, Advait. What can I do for you? Uh, hello, sir. Uh, in the introductions and the starting of the presentation, you spoke about the advantages and disadvantages of the 10 inch and 13 inch tires. We are currently yes. operating on a 10 inch tire and seeing the advantages that you have shown to us, how can we proceed to a 13 inch tire and how, uh, what all design and geometric changes might be there? We have to consider for that. Um, well, well, clearly you can't just put 13 inch wheels on the, on the current car. Um, so it, it's, uh, remember we talked about how the design works and, and essentially you start from the wheel and you work in. The, the actual geometry as far as camber gain and, and those sort of things won't be any different. It'll, it'll be the same for 13 inch and 10 inch wheels. Uh, that's nothing, uh, you know, it's just, I, I don't see I don't see any different apart from the ability to be able to get like a longer or heavier duty a brake and upright assembly to sink your out, outboard um, outboard suspension pickup points into the wheel easier so that you can reduce scrub particularly at the back to reduce it to nil if you can uh, but as far as the actual uh, kinematics uh, realistically there's no real difference and I would assume that you're going to have some uh, adjustability in your car. So you would build the car to the best of your ability and then you would adjust like crazy when you get to testing. But I just, I'd like to hear from you uh, what you thought of my justification for using 13 inch wheels. Uh, based on what you have said, uh, what we uh, understood is that <laughs> It's better to use a 13 inch uh, wheel as it gives more room to work on the insides. That is the knuckle design and the caliper. Base. Yep. And, and, and that sounds to me like having, you having oh. built a car with 10 inch wheels, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. it, it becomes sometimes very difficult to work on the inside. Yes. What, um, what tires are you currently using? Uh, currently, sir, we are using uh, Avon R10 sleeks. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's, that's a good tire. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, and thank you for your question. Thank you, Adwe. Okay, Rituja. Yes. Hi, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Rituja. So my question is, What's the best place to do tire modeling? Which software should we should prefer to do tire modeling? Um, go over to that uh, pile of uh, stuff that we put in the corner, which was roll centers and Pajeka, and then dig out Pajeka. Look, no, in all seriousness, if you want to do tire modeling, um, and you know, tire modeling is very much a black art. Um, the very first thing I would suggest to you is that you um, uh, subscribe to um, to Claude's Optimum Tire software and uh, and have your team join the Tire Testing Consortium so that you can get some uh, some um, so you can get some data that you can actually start to crunch to make make some sense of it. But uh, as far as, uh, honestly, I don't have any particular interest, nor am I a, a, an expert of any description on tire modeling or the mathematics of, of making tires work, because bluntly, I don't really believe in it. So it's a bit hard to, uh, it's a bit hard to convince me to study tire modeling if, if my heart's not in it. But, uh, but if that's your area of interest, as I said, uh, Claude, who is another contributor to, uh, another helper, one of our friends here at, uh, at Formula Barat, um, his company, Optimum G, have a, a, a software package called, uh, called Optimum Tire, and that would be as good a place as any for you to start. Um, you'll find Optimum G uh, on, 
Google optim, uh, optimum, the word optimum and the letter G, optimum G, one word, Google that and uh, find, um, find, Cla find Claude's optimum, K, uh, optimum car software, okay? Yeah, sure. Actually, we were thinking about MATLAB. Yeah, um, I'm not a MATLAB expert either, but uh, uh, yeah, and, and you're out of my area of expertise. Let me <laughs> let me surrender on that one. I give up. <laughs> but thanks for the question anyway. Thank you, Ritika. Uh, ah, we so have maybe it's a silly one question, but as you suggest, it's a floating damper will be a best option or it's a good option besides the normal push out option. So, but I seems like it will add some weight, adding more four push rods. Can you comment something on that? So, so you, uh, are you suggesting that that will add uh, additional unsprung weight in your, in your suspension? Yeah, package? same. Is that, yeah. Um, yeah, it, it, it will, it will. Um, however, it, won't add anything like the amount of unsprung weight that a, that a street tire <laughs> will add. But uh, I don't think unsprung mass or, or the, the ratio of unsprung mass to sprung mass is nearly as important as we used to think that it was. I think it's another one of those furfies that's been un, unproven comprehensively it, with the with the four wheel drive electric cars that we're now seeing that are the fastest things in Formula Student anywhere in the world. And they have wheel mounted motors that make the, the unsprung, unsprung mass to sprung mass ratio in those cars is almost one to one. And they handle well and they go fast. So I don't know that it's quite as important as we used to think it was. Um, and I think one of the reasons for that is the massive improvement in in uh, damper design that we talked about in the presentation. I think in the old days when we were using those old Kony dampers, uh, it was important to keep the unsprung mass as low as possible, so the dampers didn't have quite the amount of work to do. We used to have an old rule of thumb. We used to figure that you needed uh, three to, three to one ratio of uh, uh, rebound to bump, like the rebound force in the damper should be uh, about three times what the bump force in the damper was. And that was because we like to keep the unsprung mass at one third or one quarter of the actual total mass of the vehicle. We believed at the time that there was some ratio between those things. And, and I think that's nonsense anyway. But I, yeah, I, honestly, that uh, the, the small improvement, and sorry, the small increase in unsprung mass, I think is going to be clearly offset by the, 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 uh, the better performance of, of the, the dampers. And this is particularly true with dampers that are not particularly sophisticated. So if you have good dampers like Olin's or Cane Creek's or Penske's or something like that, maybe not so important. But if you're having to deal like the rest of us with you know, dampers which are maybe not optimum, maybe came off the back of a Baja motorcycle or something. Uh, this is a good way to make them work much better than they used to, or than, than you could expect them to do. Okay? Okay, sir. thank you very much. Got your point. No problem. Thank you for the question. Uh, Zinia, yeah, go ahead. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, hello, Zinia, what can we do for you? So, can the function of a floating damper be achieved by using well cranks and won't it give more flexibility as well? Can you rephrase that question? I'm not quite sure. We're talking about bell cranks and dampers and yeah. Because the damper, like it will give double the travel of floating yeah. damper. Yes, the yes. Bell crank can well, the function and it will have greater adjustability. Yes. Yes, with um, I mean, if you if you have uh, a floating damper, obviously you have to have a bell crank to make that work, um, and and of course you can have adjustability by having different geometries of the of the uh, of the, uh, the the damper, uh, and you can adjust the ride height simply by uh, adjusting 
the length of the push or change in the length of the push rod. Um, so, it's, it, but but it's a, it's a design that probably the two thing two two levels of warning I'll make. One is uh, it needs to be carefully designed from the beginning. It's not really something that you're going to add on to to a, a car that already exists or or a design that already exists. And the other thing that I'd say is be very careful of the load paths because you don't want to introduce additional compliance into the structure because really in that area, all compliance is going to do is to ensure that uh, you have uh, undamped springing because the, the, the compliance becomes a spring in your system. Uh, the other thing that you'd need to be very careful about is to make sure that you have all this uh, stuff actually in plane. So you're not trying to, forces don't like to go around corners. Um, you know, forces like to travel in straight lines. So you need to keep your, your force directions in plane and not try to send them around corners without them being a draw. I mean, obviously you have to send it around a corner to <laughs> through the bell crank, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm talking about sending them around corners without them being supported uh, where they change direction. Does that help you? Yes. Sir. Yeah. Obviously, it's it's a a subject which has got you thinking, and primarily, that's the reason why I make these little talks. I don't come on here to tell you to do anything. Uh, what I want to do is to rattle up the little gray cells, little brain cells, and make you think that oh, hang on a minute, there are many more options than. Um, than uh, you see in looking at somebody else's Formula student car. One, su one suggestion I would be, teams, Google uh, 1960s era, 1970s era, Formula Ford cars, Formula Ford cars. They're simple space frame cars with suspension like we use. Um, and that was highly, highly competitive uh, for, uh, form of motorsport, which still still goes on to this day. And there are some very clever solutions in all of that. Um, one thing that you will see in, the, in those cars, and something we never see in a Formula student car, is rocking beam suspensions. That's where the upper wishbone itself becomes the bell crank. And uh, you know that's that's another option where you can you can do clever things where you can uh, get more damper travel, more suspension travel, per wheel travel, than just using a direct acting suspension. There are you know, lots of other options out there. What did, uh, uh, yeah, you know, those who don't learn the lessons from history will repeat them. That's true. That's, Mr. that's true for Mr. anything. That's true for war as well. Uh, we do have one question from Pratamesh. Uh, can we take that before we end today? Uh, of, of course we can, Pratamesh. Pratamesh, please go dinner is not Dinner's not ready quite yet. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you for your question, Pratamesh. Go ahead. Hello, sir. Am I audible? Hello? Pardon? Oh, yeah, I can hear you. Okay, sir. So, as you said recently, the we give much importance to the roll center, but it is actually not that important for the car. So ah. either, uh, yes, sir. So either any other things that are given much important importance theoretically, but not. Uh, look, there are a lot of so-called experts out there who want to baffle you with bulldust, and they use things like you know, um, there there is a, a retired Formula One designer who lives in Australia whose name escapes me at the moment, but he talks about these people, he calls them the old Druids. Now, you might not be aware of the word Druid, but a Druid in the old pagan religion days before time began, they were the, the mystics or, or the high priests who baffled everybody with, with, with bull dust and black magic. Um, you know, role centers have an importance. The roll center is a good place to start the design of your suspension kinematics. You've got to start somewhere. So 
accepting that you're going to have a, 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 a role center. But today I showed you a way to start designing your suspension kinematics without any mention of, of the roll center at all. The roll center just happened. If you make your bottom suspension links parallel with the ground, horizontal, the roll center will always come above ground and will lie somewhere between the ground and the, the, uh, the, the lay of the, the suspension. And I've just had a message come up that said my battery is running low because my, my uh, computer is not plugged in. So uh, yeah, I, I, think, I think maybe the, the point for me to finish on is to say, just be careful of what you're told by anybody, question it. Ask the question, the best question you can ever ask is why? Roll center is important. Why? Um, you know, if you think for a minute, the roll centers wrap around and move around all over the place. Um, so, why are they important? They're not. Okay. Question answered. Thank you. Thank you for checking in us. With, uh, checking in with us uh, from Mount Riverview. <laughs> it was a real pleasure yes. having you. And to all our participants in today, thank you for joining us. We really appreciate your participation. Uh, and and Pat, uh, we enjoy having Pat with us every single time, both at the on-site competition and over here. So um, so uh, without further ado, thank you everyone, and uh, we will end today's session.